You guys, welcome. Uh, let me invite those of you straight outside back in. Honestly, guys, some weeks I feel like I'm in the entertainment between the coffee. <laughs> anyway, let me just pass on my greetings. It's so good to see you. Welcome. If you're new, it's great to see you. If you're not new, then we're you know, mildly indifferent, but it's still good to have you as well. Uh, no, I'm kidding. It's great to have you with us. For those of you, in, why don't you just open up your Bibles if you have one. If not, don't worry, it's going to come up on the screen. But we're going to start in Mark chapter 11. It's one of the biographies of Jesus, and he shares this really compelling story. Um, I'm going to talk. For those of you here earlier, just uh, to clarify, for those of you who are really nervous, I don't get up and dance every week. <laughs> like, that is not, that's not a thing, okay? Um, and Daniel has no idea how much trouble he's going to be in tomorrow when we have our team debrief about today. Uh, but on a, I guess in a, in a way it says something about our church, that we take Jesus seriously, but we don't take ourselves seriously. And we want to be in that place of saying, hey, Jesus, we are, like, we are in for you completely. Um, and if we have to look a bit foolish, then that's okay. Um, we are in the story of, I guess, looking at kind of what is the overarching narrative of the scriptures. And today we're going to conclude this series of God's story. What, uh, what is the church today all about? I went to a church once before I was married, and uh, I went in, and there's this old kind of Anglican church uh, in the UK, and when, when they did communion, so they said, we're going to do communion now, the strangest thing happened. The kind of pastor of the church, he stood up, and he walked to the back of the church, and everyone turned around, and they did communion facing the other way. I was like, what? why are these guys doing this? Like, I didn't grow up in the Anglican church. I was like, is this a thing? Like, is this part of the, like, traditions within the church? So I, I started to ask some people, I was like, why do you guys turn around to do communion? And no one knew. <laughs> and, like, I'd be talking to people, and say, guys, you turn around and do communion. That's really interesting. What's it all about? They're like, I don't know. We just kind of do this. Uh. Eventually, I got around to this old boy who looked like he was about 400. And I asked him, I said, why do you do, why do you he said, oh, that's really simple. In the old days, before we had a leak in the roof and we had to completely rebuild our church, the altar used to be at the back. We had a second altar at the back. I was like, but you don't have that anymore. He said, I know. <laughs> but we still turn around to do communion. I was like, is that not a bit weird? He said, a little bit. And no one seemed bothered that we would kind of stand up and turn around and just face this kind of empty space to do communion. And everyone had done this. I guess you could say this has been my journey, my kind of life journey, going, why do we do what we do as church? And so as we kind of land today, and there's been other prayers earlier, we are more and more feeling called to the church. What does it mean to be the church? Like, what did God want uh, for the church? What was his hope and his desire and his, his dream for the church? So let me read out. We're going to be in Mark 11, just really briefly, and then in, in Acts chapter 1, looking at uh, the vision for the church. So Mark chapter 11 and verse 15, this is kind of Jesus entering Jerusalem for the final time, it says this, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, It is not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you've made it a den of robbers. This was the thing it was called to be, and you've made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And then just flip uh, to your right to uh, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. I say flick. You, you guys are scrolling, right? Verse 4 says this. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is Pentecost we talked about last week. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? 
He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Lord God, this is your word. And I pray that you would challenge our hearts. Lord, would you break us out of any uh, comfort that is not of you? Would you um, shape us in your image? Lord, we want to bring ourselves before you. Lord, we don't want to be part of any pointless religious ritual. But we want to be part of your kingdom. We want to be part of what you're doing in this city, in this nation. Come, Lord, and stir in us again what you're doing, we pray. Amen. This story, looking at God's overarching narrative, how do these stories hang together is the question we've been asked. Because I think to see this, this book, the Bible, is just full of little stories, just misses out on so much. And as we close this series today, we, we don't find that this story comes to a, a really neat conclusion. It ends on this really exciting cliffhanger. The story is not just one we read and we're meant to understand, but something more is happening. This story is alive with invitation. And it's an invitation to us. Not just the person who was so excited in worship, they, they nearly knocked you out when they lifted their hands. Or not the one who looks really, really holy. This is to us, to all of us. This is a story that we saw start in the Garden of Eden with God being with his people, his presence literally amongst them that they might live a life to the fullest. That this story was about God partnering with man to see beauty and and flourishing for the power of his kingdom. And that humans would live as they're designed to live. And this idea started with Eden being God's temple where his presence would reign and reside. But this was lost in the fall. And throughout um, the story, we see what it means again to live in God's presence. God living with his people in, 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 the, in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the Old Testament. And God amongst his people in the, in the person and power of Jesus in the Gospels. And God's presence literally resided in humanity in the power of the Holy Spirit. This wonderful celebration of Pentecost last week. And these people filled... Uh, with the Spirit, went out into the Word and became the early church. And as we gather today, it's really important to remember that we are heirs of that. That we are heirs of this, of this pouring out of the Spirit of God to be His church, to be His people. And if we were to ask anyone what the role of the church is, I think we get a whole bunch of different answers. And over the 2,000 or so year history of the church, it's clear that it's, it's been both at times beautiful but also horrific. It has much that honors God and at times much that doesn't. But it's inescapable as we read through these pages that this was the plan, that God's people, his church, would be God's vehicle here on earth. There's a fascinating story about um, Winston Churchill. He'd been in the, uh, the base where Fighter Command was uh, s- uh, stationed in England, at the, the kind of the height of the battle for Britain in the Second World War. And he'd been watching the kind of plotting of how the planes were coming in and what was happening, and saw that in the kind of seemingly insurmountable odds, um, that they were resisting the kind of Nazi fighters. And as he left that day, he told his traveling companion, don't speak to me, I've never been so moved. And as he sat there in silence for about half an hour, eventually broke his silence by saying this, never before in humanity was so much owed by so many to so few. And the guy he was traveling with said this to him, but what about the 12 disciples? And Churchill said this, you are so right. And he changed this phrase, which would become iconic in British history, to never before in the field of human combat was so much owed by so many to so few. That the height of all that was going on, this person recognized the 12 disciples perhaps changed the world more than any other group of people that we'd ever seen. We stand as heirs of that group of disciples, this early church filled by the Spirit that went into our world. But I wonder what does that 
What does that mean for us? What does that mean? Throughout this series, our focus has been, what does it mean to be the temple of God? See it throughout the, the, the Bible, this idea of God's temple being his place where he would dwell, and that humanity would become a temple for God, that which hosted God's presence. And as we pick up this story in, in, the, in the book of Mark, we see Jesus' frustration at what is going wrong. We see his frustration at what the temple has become about. And he sets up the mission for what the church would be. This is, in effect, Jesus calling out the people and saying, what was given to you is something so precious, so incredible, you have ruined. You've kept my presence for yourself. If you've been around the church at all, you might have heard the story. It's quite a famous story of Jesus. But I think it's often sadly misunderstood. This isn't Jesus being taken with a sudden moment of anger. It's not Jesus just going crazy in the, in the middle of the temple. He'd already been there the night before, the Gospels tell us. This is much more calculated and intentional from Jesus. Often we think this cleansing of the temple was Jesus just wanting to rid um, of the evil money traders or, and to clean it or restore it to ritual purity. But that Jesus was somehow mounting a protest against the traders. But this just seems really unlikely. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus had already been there. He's had a good look around. He knows what's going on. Seeing the money changes in the temple wouldn't have come as a great shock to Jesus. Money changes is kind of an integral and a really important part of the system for offering sacrifice. It had to come in the correct currency, and the buying of animals there made real sense. Rather than you trekking for hundreds of miles with an animal that might get damaged and then be sacrificially impure, it made sense to buy them there. And more than that, in the, sense, there's no, the, in the text, there's no sense that these people were particularly corrupt. So something else is going on here. And then when you think of temple in our, in our day and age, when you think temple, you think quiet, reflective, the opposite of my house with three small kids. But this would have been something else. This was noisy, full of hustle and bustle, energetic, shouting. And in the center where there were sacrifices being made, there were kind of these bloody, smelly, scattered walls. On the outside of the court was this large courtyard, and, and, and anyone could kind of mingle here. And then in the center of the, it was, this, it was the temple where only the Jewish people could enter. Then the court of women, which was the last place that the women could go. Then the crowded court where only the men could go. And then there was the place where only the priests could pass before finally the Holy of Holies where only the priests could go once a year. Now this had been set up in God's law to show God's holiness. But by this point something different had happened. This was no longer used to show God's holiness but rather was being used to highlight a nation and a people's exclusivity. The temple structure, rather than now allow authentic worship, had become a distortion of that message. Instead of a beacon to the nations, it enforced the principle of exclusion. Often people think it's about Jesus getting cross with those selling animals or changing money, but it doesn't make sense of the story. Rather than trying to stop the money changing for 30 minutes until it started again, Jesus is offering a pause in the system to show that a new thing is about to happen. He's reimagining a new future. He's pointing to a new kingdom reimagined outside of the temple and in the person of Jesus. You know, the den of robbers, that phrase is not aimed at those selling goods. Have you noticed it's not the traders that are incensed by the comments, it's the religious leaders. And they plot to kill him. Why? Because it's their actions that have robbed the world of what God wanted to pour out. They are the robbers. They're the ones stealing. The custodians of temple worship and Israel's religious life had stolen what was intended for the world and kept it for themselves. And Jesus reimagines something beautiful. A pause to show this wouldn't be, always be the case. This lavishly generous future where the love of God would be poured out for all, where his grace would be given, where instead of it being held for just a few select people, Jesus would make humanity a temple for prayer for the whole nations. You see, the work of the church has always meant to be a gift to those around. And we've become experts at keeping it for ourselves. What did it mean for this love of God to be poured out for his presence in us to change the world? So this is how Jesus kind of tees up the story, if you will. 
And we see this, this is one of a number of examples where Jesus is kind of teeing up what's going to happen after he's gone. And we move then into uh, this, this wonderful passage we looked at last week. The agent did a great job of teaching on, and, and it's, uh, go back and check it out. But this vision of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming to fill. And Jesus leaves the people with this fascinating passage. Jesus says, you're about to, uh, basically, you're, he's going to say, you're about to embark on the most incredible mission the world's ever seen, but wait. Wait. And you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. What does that mean for us today? Firstly, this. This is as much about being as it is about going. This is as much about who we're becoming as where we're going. This isn't Jesus offering where they can go, but who they can become. They had been in Jerusalem for a matter of weeks and the brutal honesty of the Bible conveys that they had messed up completely. This is the the equivalent of a 21st century church in scandal. Peter, the great leader that he would become, had denied the one that he'd said he was going to follow forever. One of the groups already gone away and committed suicide. That doesn't say much about your leadership structure, does it? And they were hiding away in this room And Jesus says, it's here in this place I want you to be my witness, first of all, in Jerusalem. And I can just imagine them sat there going, are you sure? Jerusalem, it doesn't sound like a good idea. I'm not sure people are on our side. This isn't going to work out well. A witness here where everyone knows me and where they know my failures. So Jesus, we've got this other idea. How about this, Jesus? I'm sure they could have been skeptical to Jesus' plans, thinking they would never be believed in that place. But this is exactly where Jesus wants them. Not to run off to some far-flung place initially, but here where weakness and frailty is known because it would prove it was God's power and not theirs. A place where everyone knows you, in your home, with your family and your friends, those around you. I wonder, are we able to do this at home. I remember Abby sharing great, she, she challenged me on this as a few years ago. And uh, she said something to me uh, that was so powerful. She asked me a question about the Bible and I said, how do you not know that? And she said, I wish you had as much grace for your family as you did for the church. And she's right. She's so right. What does it mean for our Jerusalem to be a place of witness for Jesus? Or are we too busy looking out here We might have a passion to reach the world and that's God-given and brilliant, but it starts here at home where people know you. And it's precisely because we're known and that we're weak that the message is all the more powerful. Oswald Smith, the founder of the People's Church in Toronto, said this, the light that shines the furthest shines the brightest at home. How good is that? When Jesus says, wait for the Spirit, he's saying you need to become something that you can't be on your own. For years, I would kind of go, God, I've got this brilliant idea. Will you bless it? And I think actually more often, I think we need to say, God has a brilliant idea. Can we get involved with it? People will look at us and say, wow, how did you guys do that? It's clearly not on your own. We know that you're not very good. We know that you're not very gifted. Clearly, Jesus is at work. Jesus' desire is not that we focus on where we need to go. That will come in time, but our desire is to, to, about who we're becoming. So if that's Jerusalem. What was Judea? Well, if we see this kind of, the, the circle's moving geographically out. So we have Jerusalem here in the center, and then Judea. What is God calling us to in the place that we kind of know, that we kind of understand? This would be the equivalent of saying, what, what, does, what does Nairobi look like for us? What does our workplace or the places that we were aware of and that we're involved in. Not trying to figure out places we don't know, but the ones we do, our industry, our skills, our workplaces, our city, what has God placed in our hands to be a part of. In Judea, this was about people that get you. They understand you. These are people we might, you know, might not know intimately, but we kind of know their world. 
And this is how we begin to progress from simply those who are in our immediate world to slightly broader. But it means we need commitment to, to walk this journey with them. That this world might be on our doorstep, but it's going to take an effort to engage them. In our church circle, what does that look like? What is our Judea? What is our community that's on our doorstep? What mark may we have left on this community? Someone asked me recently, said, how big is your church? So it's about 350,000 people. And about 200 of them come on a Sunday. What does it mean to recognize that we're called into this community? To be a people for this community? One of the shifts we've realized that we need to do in our church is not to say, hey, it's great to have you with us. This is where you can serve us. But actually to say, hey, it's great to have you in our church. How do we best equip you to be on mission where God's already put you? That this, the, 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 the mission of the church is already happening because we're already planted out there into all kinds of communities and spaces. And instead of saying that the real um, value of the church is if we can draw you in and say you must serve all of our ministries. No, 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 no. People are already on mission. How do we best equip you and be an equipping body for that? We're all on mission already. We all have places that are like our Judea where we get it, where we know it, where we understand it. I once had someone say to me, he said, Chris, you need to come and, and speak to this group of, of uh, managers in my finance industry. I said, why? You're really good in that industry. You know that industry way better than I do. What would I do, turn up and talk about football? <laughs> How is God's spirit shaping us the way we work and contribute and offer ourselves? Is God allowed into our decision making or not? Is he allowed into our meetings? Or not. I was speaking to someone recently. They were involved in financing an investment. And they've moved to another country now. Sadly, they're no longer around. But as I spoke with them, I kept thinking this. Over the years that we met, this was what I was thinking. I wish you were more involved in our church. You'd be so brilliant. He came to me one day and said, Chris, I'm so grateful to you and the church and the conversation we've had. You have no idea how they shaped me in the work that I'm doing. This person who, frankly, was in a bit of an appendix on a Sunday morning, like we only noticed them when they went wrong, was a heart and a mind in the community they were based in. That they were being equipped and built up and sent out and doing some incredible work in God's kingdom. The question we ask ourselves as a church are, if we stopped tomorrow, would our community notice? And if they did notice, would it be for a good or a bad reason? Like, was it just the increase in traffic that they noticed? Or are there good reasons that they might notice? And if it was for a good reason, is it good enough? Is this what it's about? This is Jesus leaving his church, take his kingdom to every sphere of the world. Is it good enough what we're doing? Thirdly, this. As we look at what it means to reach the Samaria of our time, this was a daring vision for the lost more than country club for the found. I remember once being at a party, it was, I was in a group of people, most of whom I didn't know at all, and they were talking about all kinds of things, and they got around to talking about God, and it was clear this was a group that was pretty hostile to God. They were so angry, they didn't believe it, they talked about the corruption of the church, the bloodied history of the church, and how God does this, and God did that, and I'm just sat there going, well, this is interesting. And then, as all good conversations do, uh, they said, so what do people do here for a job? At which point I was really excited. I said, these people are not only hostile, I think they would have been angry with the pastor's dog if they felt it would have done them any good. They were so angry, they got around asking, what do you do for a job? And I said, oh, actually, I run a church. And one of them said this, why? You're such a nice guy. Why do you run a church? And another, the most vocal in the group said, did we offend you? because you deserve it if we did. It's one of the most awkward conversations I've ever been in, and someone piped up and says, go on, tell us, you high and mighty, what, what kind of church are you involved in? What church do you run? And in one of those moments where God just gives you the right thing to say, I said this, I said, well, we do church for people that hate church. And all of a sudden people went, what? <laughs> what was different about Samaria? Well, Samaria, everything was different about Samaria. 
This was the modern day equivalent of going through an Islamic state stronghold on your way into work. Traditionally, when Jews traveled north, they would have avoided going through Samaria. A uh, bit of biblical history, in kind of 700 BC, the Assyrian superpower of the day invaded Samaria and took many people into exile but left a few behind. Now, the few left behind produced children with the Assyrians who were then neither Jewish or Assyrians. They became known as the Samaritans. In the next 700 years ago, the hostility brewed over this time and it was, it was quite potent by the time of Jesus. They built their own way of worshipping God, and they were hated by the Jews. There'd been this long-running feud, crass behavior on both sides. <clears throat> so much so that the, the story of the Good Samaritan couldn't have been more shocking. It would have repulsed them, shot them to their core. The woman of the well, for those of you who know the story in John. John, if we're looking for a simple way to do evangelism, look at Jesus. He reaches out to a woman and changes her life. She becomes the first evangelist to Jesus Christ in recorded history. And he doesn't do it by saying, do you know the four spiritual laws? He does it by saying, would you like a glass of water? But for, if you just follow this, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me for this? We shouldn't be together. We shouldn't be seen together. We should not hang out. But the power of God working in Jesus reveals something powerful and he speaks into the woman's life. She runs away and says, come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? Nothing humanly would have reached this woman. If the conversation had been propelled and fueled by human intentions and thoughts, it would have reverted to conversations about nationalism, identity, cultural issues. But Jesus allows her to do something else. He allows her to meet the Messiah. And that's what we're trying to do. Our work in the Samarias of our life is not to convince people of better politics, a better worldview, or to change their behavior, but to point them to the Messiah. How do we do church for those who hate church? You know, this was when we started this church, people were asking Happy and I and, and Chikwaza and Adrian said, you guys sign a church. Nairobi doesn't need another church. And they're right. You can swing a cat and hit 20 churches very easily. But we realized, you know, it didn't need another church, but it needed a home. And a home for people because we've misread the statistic because people are leaving the church. We think they've given up on God, and they haven't. They've given up on the church. And we need to start rethinking, what does it look like to be the church for people who've given up on the church? Which means, frankly, as much as I love this, and as much as this morning was fantastic, it's going to take more than this to reach our city. Just being in a building and saying, guys, you must come to us because we do great church, it's not going to work. We're going to have to be braver and more daring than that. Tonight, for those of you who, who care for this, we have a DJ leading our worship tonight. I have no idea what that looks like. It wasn't really in my church growing up, but I'm super excited. And if it brings in people who might not otherwise meet Jesus, I am all for it. I have to learn to get over myself so that people can meet with Jesus. What does our pointing to the Messiah look like in the hostile places of our life? In the places where our faith is ridiculed and where our views are scorned. And finally this, the ends of the earth. When the power of God comes, the world, and not just the church, changes. And Jesus says earlier, he says, you know, I've come for the renewal of all things, not the renewal of the church. What gain do we have our eyes on? Is it more than us? Do we celebrate the wins of, of others? Do we get behind them? This call to the church, it doesn't mean that the mark of our success is how many people can leave for other countries. Rather, it means that we have our mindset as it is geared around and values more than simply who we are and the bubbles that we live in. It means as a church we value and support that work has its eyes fixed on the global church and not just renewal. And as we land, the story is here in our midst. And it has our name written in it. I'm going to invite um, Daniel and the band just to come back up. And as they do, you know, we've got a few minutes. We're just going to reflect before. God, sometimes we, we break into discussion groups today. We're just going to break into some time of just reflective prayer before God. I've been challenged by these questions this week. <clears throat> if Jesus were here, what would he want most from the church? 
if Jesus were right here, what would he want most from his church? And then on a personal level, what is our Judea? A place that we may know. What is our Jerusalem, our kind of family and, and our, those around us? What's our, our workplace or our place of vocation? And what are the Samarias? What are those places that feel hostile to us? Where we're called to be? You know, I've realized much of the much of the sharing people uh, with sharing with people about Jesus comes when it's pretty uncomfortable. I prayed this morning, and Faith led us brilliantly in prayer this morning about what, what's the one. And the one that I could think of is the person that kind of doesn't want to hear me talk about Jesus. That's painful. But I don't want to be hidden into a bubble where I just ignore that and think it's not important because it really is. I'm called to reach out to this generation. And the city's called to look different because God's spirit came and filled the early church and we stand as heirs and recipients of that. Guys, will you stand with me? before God and take a moment to to bring ourselves before what do we what do we bring before God Lord this is my the work of my hands will you shape it for your glory And I just like us to pray with those who are. <clears throat> I think there's two things. One is for those who are just acutely aware of of those in their own life who don't know Jesus, who are who are crying out, maybe pleading for the one. And I think we need to stand with those people. And if that if that's you, if there's someone in your life, whenever that's mentioned, whenever you hear the prodigal story, whenever you hear those far from Jesus, you know who that person is. You're like, gosh, I'm praying for this person. If that's you, just put your hands out in front of you. We want to gather around you and just pray. And if you see people around you that have their hands out, just pray for them, guys. Let's just ask them if you can lean a hand on them. Let's pray for them. Team, do we want to just be looking around just who we can pray for? Guys, there's some people in here. Megan, just behind you. James. And if it doesn't look like anyone's praying for you, just grab someone and say, I need you to pray with me. And for those who, the other thing I'd like us to pray for is those who are going, this is the Jerusalem that I'm in. This is my industry. I know it well. My Judea, sorry. Or I know it well and I know this industry. I want to know what it means to be God's witness in that place. I want to know what it means to, to live for Jesus in the way that I run this business or the way I work and operate. If that's you as well, just put your hands out in front of you. We want to pray for you. Lord, as we gather, we want to pray for the lost. I want to pray for those who are, who are far from you. Lord, we, for those who have who've prayed and prayed for years. Would you come alongside us and fill us with your love and hope as we, as we poured out? Would you take away any, any guilt that's not of you about the way we've walked with family members? Lord, help us to love those in our lives. 
Lord, help us to be like that, that father who sees the son when he's still far off and comes, and comes running, not because he condones every action, but because he knows what he needs more than anything is the love of the father. Lord, for those of us where our, our heart is hurting for our children, Would you come and show us what it, what it means to be a, a father and a mother? Would you pour out your love to us? Holy Spirit, come and fill your church. Lord, that in, in whatever way, in whatever way you've called us to, we may be your witness. Pour out your spirit on your church. Let us be renewed, Lord, with your fire. That as we practice the way of Jesus, we may see the renewal of this city and beyond. In Jesus' name.